Great. Welcome everyone to this intellectual shamans conversation. Uh, early February, 2022. Happy new year to, to all of you. I don't think I've seen many of you for this year so far. Nice to see old friends and new faces joining. Um, this is programming of the International Humanistic Management Association. Um, we're always thrilled to have Sandra and her Intellectual Shamans Forum with us. Uh, I know many of you have tuned in in the past and keep tuning in. We'll keep providing more um, really insightful conversations as we go. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Sandra, but um, I will also just mention a few logistics. Uh, I'll post some information in the chat just as we get started. Um, and uh, the way this flows is we spend about an hour together. Um, Sandra and David will kick us off and have a conversation and then we'll take any questions, resources, remarks in the chat and facilitate Q&A from there. Um, so with that, again, a warm welcome on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association. I'm going to turn it right over to Sandra Waddick from Boston College, who will uh, be moderating and facilitating the conversation today with David Cooper Ryder. Sandra. Thanks, Erica. So um, welcome, everyone. Again, put your comments and questions for David in chat. Um, I am so pleased to have David Cooper Ryder here. I, you know, we all know of his wonderful work. And I think he's going to hopefully tell us a little bit more about it today. So David is the distinguished university professor at Case Western Reserve and holds two chaired professorships, the Chuck and uh, Sharon Chuck Fowler Professor of Business as an Agent of World Benefit and the Covia slash David Cooper Writer Professorship in Appreciative Inquiry, both at the Weatherhead School of Management. David is the founder and faculty director of the Fowler Center for Business as an Agent of World Benefit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And is also the honorary chairman of Champlain College's David L. Cooper Writer Center for Appreciative Inquiry at the Robert P. Stiller School of Business. He's recently received the Organization Development Field's Lifetime Achievement Award for his pioneering work on appreciative inquiry. Um, and he's published 25 books and authored over 100 articles and book chapters. Astounding. Um, his most recent book, The Business of Building a Better World, The Leadership Revolution That is Changing Everything, um, will be out this year. Um, Professor Marty Seligman, the father of the positive of positive psychology movement, wrote, David Cooper writer, I'm getting a big buzz. Is that on my computer? Oh, thank you. Um, David Cooper writer is a giant, a giant of discovery, a giant of dissemination, and a giant of generosity. Um, likewise, Jane Dutton, who is at the University of Michigan, um, and a thought leader in her own right, it says David Cooper writer is changing the world with his ideas and who he is as a person. And those are just a few of many comments that we could use to um, talk about David's insight, his inspiration and his energy. Okay, so David, um, you pioneered appreciative inquiry um, approach to large system change. And I know that at least, well, first of all, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is appreciative and for people who might not know, although I suspect most people on this call probably know something about it. Um, maybe you can tell us what is appreciative inquiry and um, um, how you came to sort of discover it, if you will. Yeah, so it's so great to see you, Sandra, and thank you for all your work. I can remember some years back we were together at the Academy of Management on, and I think you did a session. Um, I was part of that on um, intellectual shamans. So um, thank you for all your work and for inviting me to be part of this um, wonderful group. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it's just an incredibly exciting time to be alive right now. And we'll, we can get into um, the huge, huge challenges and opportunities. But um, I started working on appreciative inquiry um, and developing um, you know, the research and theory and so on around 1979. And I think um, for me, um, you know, I, I think it started as a question for me um, earlier in my career. Um, I, when, when I was in college, I was fortunate enough um, to get a grant to um, study in Japan 
and it was, you know, I came from not a wealthy family at all. And so it was the first time I'd ever been on a plane. Um, and so you can imagine the culture shock and uh, um, multiple realities and the experience of, you know, how we can shape realities. And, um, and there was a moment on that trip that um, was like a little bit of an atomic bomb going off in my heart. And, and it was, you know, again, I was young, a junior in college, and, um, and it was on the trip to Hiroshima. And on that trip, um, and speaking with people and gathering the history and so on, it was like a, an atomic bomb of awareness going off in my heart. And it wasn't, um, it, it, was, it was like a, a, a deep level appreciation of the miracle of life on this planet and how it is in our hands in such a powerful way. And, um, and so a question for me was born, you know, what, are, what might we discover? I was studying social psychology at the time. What might we discover um, um, that's as powerful for human relationships, positive human relationships, that's as powerful for positive human relationships as the atomic bomb is for negative relationships? And um, so I think um, that was a question that was posed and um, we live into worlds that our questions create. And when I had the opportunity to work at one of the finest medical centers in the world, the Cleveland Clinic Foundation um, and a fabulous mentor, um, Suresh Srivastra, um, iconoclastic um, in his thinking um, and I was invited to come in and do a kind of a traditional organizational diagnosis. I met with the chairman of the board of direct board of governors, Dr. Kaiser, and and as I got into that system, it was it was you know challenging all the laws of bureaucracy and Michael's Iron Law of oligarchy and so on. And the physicians had a revolution a couple years earlier and said, we want um, this to be governed as a, as a democracy, as you know, where there's a physician in finance, as well as a financial person, everything is going to be together. And so, yes, it was a big mess in a lot of ways, Consen consensus, 500 person group meetings to decide things and so on. But at that moment, I, 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 I just thought, this is too precious. I am not going to do uh, a, an organizational development kind of diagnosis. I, I want to um, begin to understand everything that gives life to this living human system, this embryonic innovation, everything that gives life to this system when it's most alive, because um, we'll miss it. We won't see it and we won't lift it up. And um, my and Suresh really encouraged me to do that. I went to the chairman of the board of governors um, and literally, um, you know, there was no term appreciative inquiry at that time. Um, uh, I was studying my wife's art history books. Um, she had one by Melvin Rader, um, an anthology of creativity and, and um, aesthetics, art and aesthetics. And in it, he did make a distinction between communities of interpretation uh, which he called science, and then communities of appreciation, which he called art. And I thought, why don't those two terms come together? The, a, a science of valuing um, those things of value worth valuing. And um, so anyway, long and short, I, um, I pulled together a 50 page report of the um, inquiry process into the true, the good, the better, the possible, everything that gave life to that system and began to extrapolate and build a theory, prospective theory of the future for with them. And when I met with the Board of Governors, I'll never forget the minute the first question was, well, where's all our problems? <laughs> and, and I said, well, here in the footnote, um, we decided to do an appreciative inquiry. <laughs> and I kind of described that. And, um, you know, I, uh, there were a lot of medical um, folks in that board of 
governors and you know they were looking for the disease and medical model but once i explained it a bit they got into it in the most powerful way and then said you know um, at that time i was you know did about 400 people and interviews and so on. they said can we do this with all 8000 people and it led to 10 years and i studied it time one time two time three um, over the time and and realized that um, you know that realize that inquiry is the intervention we can even drop the word intervention um, that um, human systems become what they most deliberately and frequently and authentically and systematically and collectively ask questions about the more we studied in depth the true the good the better the possible um, the greater the idealism of the organization and the movement towards their ideals so um, appreciative inquiry you know to a dictionary definition would be you know to appreciate means to value it means to value those things worth valuing to um to to surface um excellence and what gives life and inquiry is discovery and if i was going to underscore one of the two words it would be inquiry it's it's the depth of inquiry into that that um that brought us together to build a collective theory of the future so um so it's 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 been exciting and over the years it's really shifted to you know there was never an intention that was the thing that was lost in that original writing it was never intended um to be an intervention or organization development tool um but um but simply a way to live into the idea that we live in worlds that our questions create um but now it's just moved into all kinds of practice and I can share some stories and so on. Yeah. Yeah, stories are good. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm really interested in this approach to positivity because most of us diagnose, the, and I do it all the time in my writing, diagnose the problems and the crises and all these horrible things that are happening. And yet you are consistently positive. And um, I, wanna, I wanna understand where that comes from in you and why you think that's so important um well on a personal level if i go too long without doing appreciative inquiry interviews with extraordinary people you know um sitting down with you know i mean i can share just amazing stories so personally i do it because it feeds my soul you know i'm hearing stories of um, amazing things it was wonderful to interview his holiness the dalai lama for example about his life journey and you know i asked the question um you know uh, about clarity of life purpose you know all of us as human beings one of our core tasks is to discover our purpose in life and live it to the best of our ability you know can you take share with me the moment or times um when clarity and life purpose began to emerge for you it might have been some mystical awakening it might have been some spiritual experience and so you know and and so then all of a sudden you're hearing stories that you would never have access to so part of the reason i do it is just it it, it it if i go too long without like if i'm just teaching and doing workshops on appreciative inquiry i dry up but i you know literally we become what we study and i love love that concept um and then the other is that it just is opening up so many fresh boundaries for bringing people together across, you know, big divides. And, um, and you know, we, we started um, it, it, when we would, early, we would just do the appreciative inquiry and it would just flow. And then people said, can we do it in groups, you know, in systems and, you know, like future search, we would do it in groups of 64 people um, for three or four days developing going through the 4d cycle discovery dream design and destiny and and then all of a sudden people were saying gosh we have such good people in this organization and the way we came together we've never seen this and so then people would say can we 
we need more people in the room. So we'd go up to 160 people and it got easier and more profound and longer impact. And that was a paradox, you know, you jump from small groups of eight, that's our mantra, you know, what's the most effective size group? We, we have thousand research studies that, that say it's about eight people. And so almost everything we do in management and leadership unfolds that way. Um, small groups and project teams and quality circles and senior management offsites and so on. But in all that research, we never asked most effective for what, you know, if we want to bring together a unified whole and develop a, an appreciation and respect and trust that that system has not experienced before, maybe a group of 500 dock work, if I'm worth a trucking company, 500 dock workers, truck drivers, CEO, financial officers, maybe that's more effective than one group of six to eight handing off their ideas to another group of 68 and going through the hierarchy. And, and that continued to expand. It, you know, we went from a 64 um, interactive, not, not talking heads, not um, trainings, but interactive, collaborative, um, contact and planning and designing and and then went from a, to 150 then 300 then 500 and then a CEO from Brazil I was just with his daughter yesterday um, she's amazing Larissa Lores um, a CEO from Brazil Rodrigo said you know um, we want to do this I trust this power that you're talking about in terms of wholeness you know and we were starting to study why does the experience of wholeness almost like a astronaut seeing the planet for the first time from a distance that wholeness changes their lives and we were starting to see this in these summits and um rodrigo said you know um I'd like to do this. We need, he, he was head of a big food company and they were getting really, um, it, it, the com they were losing to the big international food companies. And he said, I wanna do this. And I, <laughs> this is a true story. I was, I was too busy at the time. I was finishing a, a book and had to turn it down. Well, he called six times and he's very persistent. Each time I just, you know, said, and then I learned he re he wanted, to, he took the, the notion of wholeness so seriously, he wanted to bring all two and a half thousand people together, plus 150 customers, plus the mayor of Curitiba and citizens of Curitiba. And then I said, oh, well, now I really know that we're, we're not going to do this. <laughs> I said, just think we've, you know, 500 people is the most, you're talking about two and a half thousand people for four days to reinvent and design the, the future. And um, so I said, now I know that I can't come think of all the time we'd have to spend planning. And, you know, um, I don't know Portuguese and I've never been to Curitiba. And then, you know, I said, I'd have to come down 10, 10 times and you know you're really risking a lot here and he's he said and and then i said something that i wished i could have taken back but you know sometimes you blurt it out i said so yeah if if we didn't have to do any planning and all this pre-work you know if it was just the three and a half days yes i could do it and he said you said what <laughs> and and he said you said what I, he said fine we'll do it with no planning i trust this process and i my head must have been in you know in the academic writing sphere and and i found myself saying yes and <laughs> and then um six months went by and i had to get my tickets and I thought, well, I'll get down there a day ahead of time, you know, just to at least meet the senior team. And um, as luck would have it, there were some hurricane warnings and we stopped, landed in Miami. And so I didn't get down there until four in the morning. I'd never been to Curitiba. I was, you know, I, I couldn't sleep. The a driver came to pick me up at seven and this is how little I knew. I said, well, where did you find a convention center big enough for two and a half thousand people? And he said, well, we didn't. He said, we 
you know, we took all the food out of our warehouse and put it under plastic tarps outside and we're doing this in our warehouse facility. And then, you know, think like a facilitator. Oh my gosh, do you have sound systems? Do you have flip charts? I mean, this is how little I knew. And I was so upset at myself. I said, David, this is unethical what you said you would do. This is unethical. You know, if you were a lawyer, you would get disbarred for this kind of, you know, um, recklessness. And anyway, I share that with you um, because it, it, it was by far the most powerful, the most innovative, the most impactful summit I'd ever done up to that point. And, um, you know, their profitability was up 300% the next year. They went on to lead the sustainability revolution um, in certain parts of Brazil. Rodrigo was um, soon head of Brazil's Industrial Competitiveness Council. He became uh, a key figure in the World Business Academy movement with Willis Harmon. And, um, and anyway, um, I came away with just this tremendous, um, appreciation. We knew that appreciation is powerful, you know, talk appreciative and we knew appreciation that human systems are relationships and they come alive where there's an appreciative eye, where we see the true, the good, the better in each other and elevate and co create a dynamic of co-elevation. We knew inquiry was powerful, that human systems become what they deeply and frequently study. And so framing that is really important. What we didn't know was the power of wholeness, um, what it means to be in complete configurations of the whole. So, um, so that's my sense of hope just goes up every time we've been part of one of these. And I love um, the ecologist David Orr's definition of hope. He says, hope, hope, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And I think we that's the kind of hope we need today. That's just such a great story, David. I'm, I'm struck by several words in what you're talking about that sort of set your work apart from much of the work that is done in management thinking and research. And one of them is future, the future orientation, or what uh, I just read what Chris Chris, I saw Chris on this call, Chris Laszlo's okay. article on prospective theor theorizing. Um, so it's it's this perspective uh, of building the future, building a different future and really going out there and saying, what is this world we want to live in? And the, that combined with the, the notion of inquiry and the positivity. Um, and, you know, how do you get to thinking like that? And what are, what are the risks you take in doing that? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I, I was really influenced by Ken Gergen's concepts um, early on. Um, he was talking about, you know, the objectivist approach to science and so on. And, you know, as it, it you know, it, it's clear that there are no iron laws as it relates to human interaction and society and so on, that it is constructed through our choices and our dialogues and our imagination and so on. And so he talked about um, the need for generative theory that so much of our reductionist science has just resulted in too little, you know, um, and generative theory he defined as theory that opens the world to new possibilities that challenges the status quo and creates new possibilities for human action to, and so on. So, um, so that's, you know, it originally uh, appreciative inquiry was meant to be um, a, a, a theory building, a grounded theory building methodology that opens the world to new possibilities. And, um, you know, and in that, I think there is a big shift in our understanding of human action, um, you know, and we could trace it, you know, in the days of psychoanalytics and so on, you would understand human action in the present by going back into history, that those first two and a half years or the family and so on. And you could then understand human action in the present. And then in the 50s and 60s, Kurt Lewin and others began to say, no, it's not just the, the past that causes human action. 
um, it's it, it's the present current environment. So that whole um, formula that Kurt Lewin had that behavior is a function of the person and the system, the environment that they're in. And so, yes, we change the assembly line and behavior changes and so on. But I think what's happening, um, been happening for some time is a prospective theory of human action that human action isn't just caused by the past. It's not just conditioned by the present, but it's caused largely by the future. Now that hasn't happened yet. So how can human action be caused by a future that hasn't happened? And it's obviously through the dynamic of anticipatory reality. Um, and so um, I did a, a, an article that pulled together a lot of this, like starting with the Dutch sociologist Fred Pollack. He um, studied, you know, um, he, he, post World War II, um, he saw the cynicism and so on in society. And he was wondering, you know, can, can we predict 10 to 25 years ahead of time the decline and fall of a society? And his argument ended up beginning with the image of the future, that it's the guiding image of the future. And that he said, any student of the rise and fall of cultures can't fail to be impressed by the historical succession of the images of the future, the guiding images of the future. And, um, and, he, and, and he traced it to, you know, um, this uh, whole idea in psychology today of the inner dialogue, you know, that we all have an inner dialogue about ourselves and about our future. I'm a good person. I'm not such a good person. My future is exciting and compelling and filled with purpose and meaning and significance. And, and he, in those, in his early writing, um, could see that in the societies where the discourse was like nine to one in the negative direction um, publicly. And he'd say, you know, well, what are the youth? You know, what are their, 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 what words do they use to describe the future? What metaphors do they use to describe the future? And, you know, and I, and I think today, you know, with all the research on what good, for example, are positive emotions and Barbara Fredrickson's classic work and finding that, you know, when in relationships, when there is at least a four to one ratio, you know, she's studying in the laboratory, hope, inspiration, joy. She has 10 emo uh, emotions that she's studying and how they broaden and build our capacities and create um, pro-social relationships and so on. Well, all of a sudden you ask, what's the ratio of positive to negative self-talk in our current society, you know, in the big city newspapers and, uh, and so on. And um, so, I think there is a lot of good work. Um, Marty Seligman just came out with a new book called Homo Prospectus, um, that that is the central element of the human being, um, how anticipatory reality, and it's a simple notion, you know, <laughs> I, I am very shy and I hit, it had times in early speeches where I actually froze on the stage. After I did that, um, then every time I was writing a speech, my heartbeat, just anticipating that, um, my heartbeat and my blood pressure would go up just as high as, a, as, as if I was there. So a lot of great work now is converging around the idea of, and the hopeful point of the prospective theory of human action and prospective theory and um, anticipatory reality is that um, is that we can come together like I see it in these summits with whole cities coming together and reshaping the discourse, the metaphors they use about the future, the ways that that anticipatory reality then works backwards to to help create that that possibility. So anyway, I'm not sure I answered your question completely, but um, but I, I do think this whole notion of homo prospectus and prospective reality is important and especially in theory building. I, that is, I, you did answer my question, thank you. Um, I have so many other questions, but there's so many good ones in the chat that, I'm, um, that I wanna get to, but I just wanna, there's two other initiatives that I, I wish you just briefly talk about. One is, I know you're doing a special issue 
of the org, org development practitioner mm -hmm. because you have a vision for the future of the field i think that's a little different from where it is today and you also have a, a similar vision around business mm -hmm. uh, it, okay. so you started this business as an agent of world benefit yeah. Yeah. Initially, and um out of that came the aim to flourish prizes and all of that so so there's this there's this constellation of things that have this sort of same orientation to them and i, yeah. I wonder if you could just talk about those a little bit yeah no it's it's an incredibly important moment um you know and you think about the decades as we started the 2020s you know and we started with all the climate mega floods and mega fires around the world and then um and then the global pandemic um, is upon us and all this um economic collapse and challenges and um and then george floyd and you know i can't breathe and i think our whole society was having trouble breathing and the attacks on democracy and so on so i do feel like there is a really important call not just to business but in a trisectoral way um and I got my feet wet in it, and when I use the frame, frame business as an agent of world benefit, um, I'll share the story where I, those words um, emerge for us, but um, it's, it's a question, it's not an answer, you know, business as a force for peace and high conflict zones, what, where is it, what does it look like, where are the dynamics, business as a force for eradicating extreme poverty and uh, business as a force for this massive once in a civilization type transition moment you know to 100 percent renewable energy world so um so and, and for me i got my feet wet in in this um it was um again it was out of my league um but you know um we got the call um so kofi annan called um my office and had says you know i want to host the largest meeting in history between business leaders and the UN and civil society. And, um, you know, we heard about appreciative inquiry. We think that could change the way we do world summits, you know, and obviously most world summits are talking heads and pre negotiated agreements and anything but real collaborative dynamic. And, um, and so we brought a team of masters and PhD students. It was exciting, it changed their lives. Um, and, you know, it, it, and for me, um, besides the appreciative inquiry, part of it, um, you know, I, I, I could show you some film clips of it. It was very exciting. There wasn't even a place in the UN where you could sit at round tables, <laughs> if you can imagine that at the New York. I mean, we were searching every, everything was bolted down chairs and hierarchies and you have to press the buttons to talk and so on. So ultimately we took over the delegates dining hall and um and we were able to be in groups of eight and work you know deliberately through the discovery dream design and so on phase um and it it, it that's when um I, I thought that's what i want to study i want to study business as a force for peace and high conflict zones and this and that um that meeting went so well um that the next one was in switzerland three years later and the global compact um, just experienced tremendous growth at that point they went from a thousand companies um, today um, it's over over fifteen thousand companies from 100 and i don't know 48 countries or something um, so that was a privilege and and um, in the next meeting um, I just felt even more inspired. Um, I can share one group discussion I had. I was at a table with incredible people. So Jeffrey Sachs, he's the economist from Columbia that you all know, and he's spoken here, I think, um, and he's brilliant. And so he, we're all doing the appreciative inquiry interviews and lifting up stories. We lifted up about 2000 stories that day in that room. And um, and so he's sharing the story and he's pounding the table and he's trying to get everybody to awaken to the fact of that, you know, and that he had just he had written his classic volume on the end of poverty and how we can be the first generation in all of human history and that it's within our grasp and collective will and and, and he shared 
the micro enterprise models that for less than $150 per person in a village, you can jumpstart the economic empowerment and soon there are schools and hospitals for the children and so on. So he was just pounding a table. Why don't we get it? What a moment in history and what we're going to be able to contribute to. He was sounded like a John F. Kennedy. Um, and then um, Jane Nelson, um, uh, she's the um, she's head of the Kennedy School of Leadership, and she started saying, you know, yes, the things we're going to see in our lifetimes, and she shared the recent studies out of Vienna, um, where they now can spray solar cells onto windows, and every building can become a clean, renewable, abundant energy source, and. She said that the kinds of things we're going to see in the next few years is just um, beyond the imagination. Um, and then, um, you know, um, I had some companies from Cleveland and the chief financial officer gets up and talks about the fully human organization that's possible as we in, envelop the system and, and, and work through high purpose. And then, um, um, then um, Neville Isdell, at that time, the head of um, Coca-Cola, stood up and he just was shaking. And he said, it is time that with the capacities we have as a human family, it is time for all of us as CEOs to stand up, step up and to scale up. And so, um, so that, was, um, that was exciting. We, um, we went on to create a partnership. We have done five global forums for business as an agent of world benefit. Um, the last one involved 10,000 people. Um, I, the new book that came out of that, it's called The Business of Building a Better World. And it's got a playbook along with it now um, to put it in motion. We've created kind of all the best of all the large scale appreciative inquiry summits we've ever done and put it into a, a, a playbook where it, you know, it can save people probably 10 days you know, in, in their designing of these kinds of things. But it's, um, I, for me, the new concept is, and this is in, in positive psychology, Marty Seligman talked about three pillars to, um, to the study of flourishing, basically, as the dependent variable, as the as the center around everything radiates. And, um, and he said, you know, the, the pillars of the, the field would be the study of positive human experience, you know, hope, inspiration, and so on. Um, uh, the study of positive human strengths. So now there's this nice classification of human strengths instead of just an encyclopedia diagnostic manual of mental illness with 10,000 technical terms on what's wrong with the human being. Now there's a taxonomy to talk about human strengths and capacities. But the third was the discovery and design of positive institutions. And, um, and there was no definition of that. And building on the body of work and the, the encyclopedia of human strengths, um, Lindsay Gottwin, my colleague and I um, did a paper and, and took a stab at defining what is a positive institution. Um, and we've defined it as a positive institutions are are organizations and institutionalized patterns um, that elevate our highest human strengths, you know, wisdom, courage, sense of justice, humanity, that elevate our highest human strengths, that combine and magnify and multiply those strengths like in an AI summit, but ultimately refract our highest human strengths into society, into the world towards a world of full spectrum flourishing. And we define full spectrum flourishing as a world where as, as a world where economies and organizations can excel, all people can thrive, and nature can flourish, not just now, but across the generations. So positive institution. So the next step in that thinking is say, starting to realize when we're seeing all of these institutions taking our OD methods and scaling them up. Um, and so the, the, the thought experiment we had was, what if we started viewing institutions not as our clients of change, but they now are the change agents? And if we take that experiment, thought experiment further, 
that the institutions are now the change agents, um, then we want to say, what are the interventions that they're doing? Um, you know, what kinds of interventions are they doing um, as, as platforms for world change? And, um, and, and so uh, we are doing a special issue of the organization development review on that. And um, there's just so much exciting things happening. So where institutions take what they learned with strategic convening, for example, with our appreciative inquiry summits, um, and then they host whole industries. They host, like um, one uh, organization that we were working with hosted and brought the methods to um, the whole dairy industry. And so we hosted and they led the summit using appreciative inquiry. We've taken it now and call it the appreciative inquiry um, sustainable design summit. And there's a lot more you know, design thinking in it in terms of rapid prototyping. But that dairy industry summit created a platform um, that like a constitution that everybody signed what we we hold these truths to be self-evident this is what we're going to be working on and um, and it's just grown and grown and grown um, we were um, early on we were hosted at the White House um, and the the um, Obama administration pointed to that as an industry that's getting its act together um, and moving it. Um, so I got you know some articles on this one, but um, but so that that's exciting because we can now start thinking of systems change in a much more um, powerful way, you know, um, and and where institutions with like when we say world. Um, agent of world benefit. Now we're getting clear that it's a platform model where institutions augment our human capacities. Um, Patagonia, for example, now um, has taken and created um, activation website where there are thousands and thousands of customers can find environmental initiatives and then they connect them to those environmental initiatives so that their customers can lead lives of more meaning, purpose, and significance, and impact, and so on. Um, so that's where you know, the institutions are moving um, towards not just programs of change, but platforms of connection for creating that change. Yeah, you're, you're speaking to the work yeah. that I've been doing for the last 10 years or so now. Um, I want to turn um, turn to some questions from the audience. Um, Lee Robbins, you want to unmute yourself and ask one of your questions? I know there's several that you've put up. Sure. Uh, so David, I've been very appreciative of appreciative inquiry and the perspective of it for a long time, uh, perhaps particularly as it countered by my others well-intended hypotheses which turned out not to be true mm. that uh if somebody is doing something right there's no point in mentioning it and oh. if they're doing something wrong it's not only you're not only allowed but in fact obligated to point it out i think it's a reasonable hypothesis but empirically uh it doesn't work out well okay but the piece the question is the piece about appreciative inquiry that and I, I think I actually I may have solved it for myself in your talk, okay. is not the positive part, but about ignoring the negative and that it will wither away. And that's the piece that I have been skeptical about, though I yeah. think I have yeah. an answer for it now. And I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that aspect. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in some sense, there could be a theory of change, like a replacement theory of change, um, you know, that we're, um, establishing the new and eclipsing the old. Um, I, I take quite seriously the um, ratios that are emerging in our work. We did studies of um, like 10 different organizational efforts. And, and it's, it's not that they're not focusing on deficiencies, but they're, it's, it's wrapping the change agenda at least in a four to one ratio of strength-based inquiry, search and for life, um, resourcing the system, 
you know, surrounding the change agenda in a surround sound of capacities and strengths and collective will and so on. So it's not that, it, and so there's nothing in appreciative inquiry where we um, say, you know, oh, we can't bring that up, union labor, you know, the teamsters and the truck drivers, we can't bring up the past patterns in the last negotiation. There's nothing about it, but we do, um, we do kind of, we let the groups take it where it's going to go. Um, but um, we, we are, we're finding that if, when we take this, not, um, not a, when we take this resourcing theory of change and resource it, and because, you know, there, there, that somehow it just changes then the relationships um, in some of the highest conflict zones. So um, this one, again, was another one out of my league when Dalai Lama's office called, he had been in Jerusalem and um, he felt the tensions in the world in a way he hadn't, you know, there were suicide bombers while he was there and this and that. And he, he said to the person with him or the team, he said, oh my gosh, you know, here we are, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, all these different groups shooting each other in the name of their gods. And, and he said, you know, um, if only we could just, the higher up we go in the religions, the less we talk, he said. Um, you know, somehow the roles, the higher up you go. And he said, for example, I've been on the same platform as the Pope, but we don't know what's in each other's hearts. You know, and so they said, well, what would you like to do? Um, and someone said that you should use appreciative inquiry and try and work and create a kind of a living um, e experiment with new kinds of dialogue across the religions. And so um, the first one happened um, and, you know, there, there were, you know, definitely some conflicts and big ones, but they got worked out. That went so well that they decided to go to the next one and expand it at the Jimmy Carter Center with his interest in conflict resolution. And then, then it happened where they decided to go to um, Jerusalem, and you know, the imams that came said I could get shot the minute I move out of this meeting, and it was. There were moments of, you know, but the appreciative early part of the appreciative inquiry wrapped the system in kind of, you know, a heartfelt embodied trust. And um, this one, you know, there was a moment in terms of conflict that it broke pretty high, you know, um, one of the imams said to the rabbis and the Christian leaders, you know, Ours is not a theology of love. Yours is a theology of love. Ours is not a theology of love. Don't talk about ours. Ours is a theology of justice. Don't talk about love your neighbor until the bulldozing stops and so on. So anyway, there's nothing about a preach of inquiry that says, hey, time out, we're not gonna go there. But the fabric of relationships, we're finding we trust that the group knows when it can go into the deepest levels. Um, and, um, and in that particular case, they got so courageous, they said, boy, the respect we have for one another here, and they said, you know, the respect has grown so much. They said, you know, we don't have at the high, high many pictures, for example, um, uh, we, we've got pictures like historical ones, black and white coming together, you know, Mandela and de Klerk and in and, and, and big papers and, and Time magazines or whatever. But we don't have something like that, like a Pope and a Dalai Lama hugging, you know. So they said, you know, we need to go out and show our love and respect for one another publicly. So. It, we had to, it had to have, you know, it was complex. There were to organize it and probably dangerous. They had to bring the bomb dogs and so on. But we went to the Jewish wall and prayed and meditated with each other. Um, we then went to the Dome of the Rock and prayed and meditated. And then we ended up um, uh, Dalai Lama leading a prayer and meditation in Christ's tomb. 
And I started feeling, you know, more than what I would bargain for as a business school professor. You know, I felt feelings of respect and so on in ways that I hadn't felt before. Um, anyway, a subgroup went off and created then a pattern. Um, it's called the United Religions Initiative. Um, and there's now 9,000 centers around the world. And the purpose is to end religious violence and create cultures of peace and justice. And um, so I mentioned that one because it was fraught with conflict, you know, I mean, and um, but we just, we, we, we work to resource the group with all the stories of times of the most important interfaith encounter you've ever had that led to a breakthrough in your thinking, you know, things like that. So David, we, we have so many good questions. Um, and only about eight, eight or nine minutes. Left. Okay, I'm sorry. So, yeah. That's okay. Um, I want to pick up two people, Connie Fuller and Mary Lou Kotecki asked about basketball and your children. <laughs> and they wondered if you recount whatever story that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there is interesting research on it was in athletics where they're saying, how do we um, take a task that you just don't know how to do and, and accelerate learning. And the, the early experiments in that were around bowling and they bring people together to a bowling camp who had never bowled. And obviously their scores were very poor at the beginning. Um, and then it, every day, the morning, people would get the same amount of personal coaching and practice and teaching, but then they'd come back in the afternoon and they would see a videotape of their morning. And in this uh, series of studies with one group, they would erase everything the group did right and just leave everything that was wrong when the ball fell on the foot and when it went into the gutter and when they were awkward and so on. And they would put together a, a condensed videotape of all of those mistakes and, and um, bad, you know, not, in that good stuff. And they would show that in the afternoon to teach with the idea that that's going to motivate us and make us want to get better. And then the other group, they did just the opposite. They edited out everything that the groups did wrong and left everything they did right or progressively right. Like, um, like Theresa Amabile, the, the, like the whole um, Harvard business book on the progress principle, noticing the smallest progress moment that you can. Well, then they take those tapes with just condensed versions of all these progress moments and teach. And you can guess which group after three weeks outperform the other. Um, what people don't guess is by how much, you know, um, yes, the positive imagined group um, it, it excelled in their rate of learning. Was it 10%? No, 20%? No, 30%? It was 100% difference in rate of learning. <laughs> and so um, I, I immediately, our kids were in a public um, a community, real wonderful, rich community, um, you know, a fabric of relationships and um, a, a basketball league. And I think, you know, this was around 2000. And, and I decided, decided that I would want to do a, um, I wanted to do a, a, a highlight film for each of the kids, Daniel, Matthew, Hannah, the youngest. Um, they were about 12, 10, and eight. Um, and it was so cute. We, um, we, we did, I did videotapes. I was going to present them at the end of the year. Uh, uh, synopsis of, of all the growth and learning and best plays. And then I thought, no, I'm going to change it, change, the, change this process. I'm going to have them choose what are the best plays so that we can get conversation going. And all of a sudden, it was so cool to see their relationships change you know instead of the sibling rivalry Daniel would say daddy put this one in put this one in and the younger sister would say no no Daniel that's not your best one and daddy back up and um, I'd back up and I'd say Hannah makes the case and she then her vocabulary of of you know just got so you know Daniel did you see your eyes were on the basketball and how unselfish you were Anyway, the long and short of it is, is that um, 
it changed their relationships. They started seeing a different game on the, on the, on the floor. They were seeing each person's, all the different capabilities and contributions they were making. Um, and the end of the story is, this is totally true. Um, my son, Matthew, well, Daniel hit, um, he, I, and this is a father that never played basketball, but Daniel um, hits 91% of his free throws that year. That was the same as the number one person in the NBA. This is true story. And then Matthew, he, he went on um, to join the free throw shooting contest in the state. He won the district, his school, the region and then ended up on Le LeBron James um, basketball floor and hit all 10 out of 10. <laughs> and it was, it was just an experiment where I just, um, you know, followed that bowling story. Um, and I, the, there, there's so many appreciative things that we could be doing that are just waiting for um, that capacity. And, and with, with my daughter, for example, I learned when I'm gone for two, a month in India or whatever, and I come back, that she is likely a different human being. I, that wake up my appreciative eye, David. You know, she wants her father to see the, what new is stirring in her soul, what new qualities and friendships and interests. And every time I would pause to do that, um, the relationship got stronger. So David, we, we only have time for one quick question. I wanna pick up on Jen Traxler's question, but I also wanna add the one I wanted to ask you because I know that the early stages of your career were difficult. And part of the Intellectual Shamans webinar is um, to help people who are at different stages of their career to blossom and understand that there are many paths to, um, to success. Um, Jen, you wanna quickly ask your question and then we'll let David respond with it. Sure, thank you very much. I appreciate being acknowledged for that. Um, I am a doctoral candidate at BG's in the cohort one for the Doctorate of Organization Development and Change. And I'm a huge admirer of yours and um, appreciative inquiry, especially. Um, one of the things I've always heard about all the positive stories that have come out and all the change, the great change that has happened, but as being a budding scholar practitioner, <laughs> more on the practitioner side than, than the scholar still a little bit, but um, what were some of the, the learnings that you had early on that maybe weren't as, uh, as successful and that helped shape uh, appreciative inquiry even further? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, like in the whole building of the United Religions Initiative, um, there were some really, really challenging moments um, that I just, I, I couldn't have anticipated and I had no idea what to do. Um, this we were we were in um, the Fairmont Hotel where the UN Charter was written, and we were writing the Charter and Constitution for this um, in San Francisco, and and then um, then people decided let's open it to the public one night in a big big auditorium because it was all over you know the the media was covering it, and they were covering it you know somewhat cynically. Um, you know, that you can imagine all these religious leaders coming together to brainstorm and it's not working this or that. And um, it was, it, it, what it ended up doing was just, it was so far from reality, it mobilized the group to really make some daring stuff. But then in that, in that open convention center, there was a staged protest um, and it was powerful. And it was, you know, protesters in this part of the room and this part of the room. And it was just, it was extreme, extreme far right. You know, you're all going to go to hell. You're all going to, and, um, you know, so what did we do? Um, we ended up inviting those groups into the summit. And that was powerful. Um, it turned out to be the right thing to do. Um, it was, and you know, a, a similar thing happened with the United Nations. There were so many protest groups outside that, you know, why is the UN meeting with all these business leaders? They're going to get bought out. Um, so we sent teams out and brought the protesters in. 
So those kinds of things, um, you know, are hard. Yeah. Thank you, David. Um, unfortunately, we have to stop, but there's already been a request. Would you do be willing to do a part two that really focus that really focuses on how, as academics in management, we can make the world better through yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I would, and it's a wonderful group, and um, and I never, you know, I, I just I I do I I, I do think this is. Um, I don't know if you've studied Mariana Mazacuto, the just up and coming economist. Her work is incredible. Um, and she calls it mission economics. And she's studied lots and lots and lots of, well, the classic is, is the Kennedy moonshot and what it did for the economy and what it did for dynamism and bringing people together across sectors and collaborations and so on. Well, she's studied that kind of thing in 130 different countries. And she's clear that that's when the dynamism of an economy is at its best. It's, it's, it, it, and she's suggesting that, um, that we really need to shape this moment as an earth shot moment. These next two decades are decisive. And, um, and I'd love to explore with you how to give these next two decades that kind of creativity and goodwill and experimentation. You know, when John F. Kennedy said we we're going to put a person on the moon and return them safely to Earth, not because it's easy, but because it's difficult. Well, this at a moment where we literally have to reinvent the entire material basis of our civilization. You know, every industry, every company, every, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna realize keeping the warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, we are so far away from that. How do we call the world and help shape that the context of this? Um, I would love to get your help on that. I would love to work with you on that. That's what we're trying to do in the work that I'm doing. And I just want to thank everyone for your great comments. I apologize for not being able to get to them. Um, uh, um, and thank you, David, for a very inspiring talk. Uh, there's a ton of comments coming through about how inspiring the session has been. And thank you again for uh, spending your time with us. So, um, Yes, thank you on behalf of the International Humanistic Management Association. Thanks to everyone who joined today and community. Um, so powerful, so inspiring. Uh, I think there's uh, a good case to be made for doing this again, hopefully with David, if he's <laughs> agreeable to that. So thank you so much, Sandra. Many thanks for leading this um, incredible initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra and Erica and everybody. It was nice to be with you. Yeah. Nice to be with you. Bye, everyone. Take good care. Bye.